It was a coup. On the 10th of November 2019, Bolivia's president, Evo Morales Aima, resigned from office. He had been re-elected to the presidency on the 23rd of October. This was to be his fourth term in office. On the 9th of November, rumors across Bolivia suggested that the police would open a corridor for right-wing militias to enter the presidential palace and kill Morales. Tension gripped the country. Morales came before the press, called for fresh elections, and said that the Congress can appoint a new election commission. The political parties of the oligarchy, led by Morales's challenger, Carlos Mesa, rejected the offer. Mesa, who had been the president before Morales, had called for permanent protests after he had lost the election. These permanent protests escalated into a rebellion, with the police joining the ranks of an insurgency of the oligarchs. The police were frustrated with Morales because he had taken away their opportunities for petty corruption. Morales might have remained in power had the military stayed neutral. But General William Scaliman, who was trained by the U.S. military, asked Morales to step down. It was less a request than a demand. Morales had no choice. He had to resign. When Evo Morales came to power in 2006, he was the first indigenous president of this republic, which was formed in 1825. Two-thirds of Bolivia's population come from various indigenous communities. They have lived in poverty and have suffered humiliation from those who claim descent from the Spaniards. Morales had won a landslide in 2005, which enabled his movement for socialism, MAS, to drive an agenda for the vast mass of the people, including to push for dignity for the indigenous communities. In the newly written Constitution, 2009, the flag of the indigenous communities, the Huipala, became equivalent to the old flag of Bolivia. This gesture was fundamental, as the Huipala was sewn under the uniforms of the military and it was raised under government buildings. Bolivia, this plurinational state, was no longer going to denigrate its indigenous heritage. Morales, as president, put forward not only an indigenous agenda, but a socialist one as well. His movement for socialism was formed by a range of social and political movements, which included organizations of the indigenous and trade unions. His predecessor, Carlos Mesa, was hit hard by protests against gas and water privatization and against the destruction of Bolivia's coca crop. Morales, a leader of the coca growers, was rooted in these movements. At the United Nations in 2019, Evo Morales said that Bolivia, since 2006, has cut its poverty from 38.2% to 15.2%, increased its life expectancy rate by nine years, is now 100% literate, has developed a universal health care system, ensured that over a million women received land tenure, and have a parliament where more than 50% of the elected officials are women. How did Bolivia do this? We nationalized our natural resources, Morales said, and our strategic companies. We have taken control of our destiny. These resources, which include fossil fuels, but also key strategic metals such as indium and lithium, have been desired by transnational firms for decades. During his 13 years as president, Morales was able to tackle hundreds of years of entrenched inequality. Morales won his first election to the presidency when the pink tide had been established from Venezuela to Argentina. When commodity prices fell, many of these left-leaning governments lost power, but Morales remained popular and won election after election on a firm mandate of expanding Bolivian democracy. But he faced opposition from Bolivia's oligarchy and from the U.S., which had long wanted Morales removed from office. When Morales came to power, the U.S. Embassy in La Paz, Bolivia's capital, called him an illegal coca agitator. Plans to destabilize the government began immediately. The new government was informed that the U.S. would delay all loans and discussions on debt relief until Morales displayed good behavior. If he tried to nationalize any of the key sectors, or if he rolled back the anti-coca policies, then he would be penalized. 
Morales showed no such fealty to the U.S. In fact, he embraced the turn to the left in Latin America and developed a very close link to both Cuba and Venezuela. Fears of a coup are not distant in Bolivia, which has had coups in 1964, 1970, and 1980. The armed forces, highly influenced by the U.S., were always on standby for a scenario where they could eject Morales. But the enormous popularity of Morales personally and of the mass prevented any such armed action. Morales's socialist agenda improved the everyday lives of the people, even as commodity prices declined. The coup against Morales was always on the agenda, but it had to be delayed because of his deep ties with the people and because of his successful socialist agenda. The lead-up to the election of the 20th of October 2019 was highly fraught. Morales had sought a fourth term, for which he required judicial sanction. The Supreme Court ruled in November 2017 that he could run for another term. In this election, Morales beat Carlos Mesa by over 10 points, sufficient for him to win the presidency in the first round of voting. But Mesa refused to accept the result. The OAS, deeply politicized and highly influenced by the U.S., sent in a monitoring team whose preliminary report found irregularities in the counting of the votes. The entire case by the OAS rested on what it called drastic and hard-to-explain change in the trend of the preliminary results after the closing of the polls. But the OAS offered no evidence for this claim. The Center for Economic and Policy Research found that there were no irregularities and that the OAS claim was unfounded. In February 2020, long after the coup had taken place, two researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology found no evidence of any fraud in the election. The OAS refused to get back to them or to anyone with a comment. Nonetheless, key U.S. officials and the Bolivian oligarchy seized on the OAS claim and tried to nullify the election results. It was based on this that the right wing called upon its support base to flood the streets, and it was based on this that the police forces decided to mutiny. The role of the OAS and the U.S. government in giving legitimacy to the coup process was key. In July 2007, U.S. Ambassador Philip Goldberg sent a cable to Washington in which he pointed out that U.S. mining firms had approached his embassy to ask about the investment climate in Bolivia. Goldberg felt that the situation for mining firms was not good. When asked if he could organize a meeting with Vice President Alvaro Garcia Linera, he said, Sadly, without dynamite in the streets, it is uncertain whether the embassy or the international mining companies will be able to attain even this minimal goal. Without dynamite in the streets, a phrase worth dwelling upon. A year later, Morales expelled Goldberg from Bolivia, accusing him of aiding the protests in the town of Santa Clara. A decade later, it was the dynamite that removed Morales from power.